Good evening. Good evening and welcome to MIT. It's great to see another large crowd for tonight's uh, presentation. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes and then I'm going to pass it on to Pete Shanahan who will do the real introductions. Uh, my name is Eric Adams. I'm from MIT and I'm one of seven members of the John R. Freeman Committee uh, of the BSEE, uh, BSEES. Um, this lecture is an annual presentation that is in honor of John R. Freeman and it's put on jointly by the Environmental and Water Resources Group of BSCES as well as the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at MIT. Uh, some of you might have noticed that there are some brochures outside advertising BSCE, BSCES, and they, this is one of a number of activities that they do that uh, are, are interesting, and if some of you are not members of BSCES, then uh, you might consider um, joining. As most of you know, uh, John R. Freeman uh, was a graduate of MIT. He was a famous engineer who worked around the tail end of the previous uh, century, and he did a number of projects, including locally uh, the design of the original Charles River Dam. When he died, um, before he died, he left some money to the group with the purpose of applying that to the education of young hydraulic engineers, loosely interpreted. And this annual uh, Freeman Lecture is one way that that money is used. Uh, we also offer grants for students and young engineers in practice, both in the private and the public sector to engage in various educational activities and we'd encourage people to contact us if they fall into that category and have a need for a, a modest grant to, to help them do something worthwhile. Uh, you can take a look at the web site um, and I'll tell you how to get there in just a second. That'll give you a summary of some of the recent activities that have been sponsored and it'll also summarize what the, uh, the history of the Freeman Fund Committee is going back to a about 1925. Um, the easiest way to get there is simply to Google on BSCES, that's an acronym for Boston Society of Civil Engineers section of ASCE, but BSCES Freeman Fund, and, and you'll be able to get a beautiful picture like that all on your own. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Pete Shanahan, number, a number another uh, MIT person who's a member of the committee, and he'll do the formal introductions. Pete. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Dennis LeBlanc of the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, Eric just introduced me as a member here of the, the MIT faculty. Um, this is, in fact, my second career, and uh, at least some of the folks in the audience know me from my earlier career, which was as a practicing environmental engineer. Uh, particularly, I was active in groundwater remediation, among other things. Uh, as such, I was an avid consumer of the many, many studies produced by Dennis and his many talented colleagues at the USGS and the many collaborators from outside the USGS that also worked with him. At last count, the USGS team and their collabor collaborators at the Cape Cod Toxics Research Site have published 126 journal articles, 44 uh, MS and PhD theses, 58 USGS and US EPA reports, and another 44 proceedings papers and book chapters. Uh, they may not have pumped a whole lot of groundwater out of the site, but they certainly pumped a lot of papers out of the site. Uh, this body of work has spanned uh, the range from some very fundamental academic sud studies of subsurface processes to very practical developments in field sampling techniques. On the fundamental side, a very well-known study of dispersion completed at the USGS experimental field site in the 1980s, along with similar work by the University of Waterloo and Borden, Ontario, changed how we think about dispersion in groundwater systems. And several of the folks who are instrumental in that, in fact, I think most of the folks who are instrumental in that study are here tonight. Steve Garabedian, 
uh, Professor Lynn Gelhar, Kathy Hess, and of course Dennis. Um, if you uh, go to um, the second edition of Groundwater Hydrology by David Keith Todd, he has this figure, and you see the dispersion of particles in groundwater moving ever and ever wider around particle around the particle matrix, and uh, the studies done at the U.S done by the USGS showed us that this model was wrong. And this picture doesn't appear in the third edition of Todd's textbook. And in fact, our thinking about how dispersion happens in groundwater systems has been fundamentally changed as a result of these studies. Dennis and his colleagues took the, the knowledge and experience gained from these fundamental studies to a new problem beginning in the 1990s, helping to clean up the legacy of decades of military activities at the Mass Military Reservation. The USGS studies here have built a foundation of basic knowledge and understanding of the hydrologic system that has enabled the various military, um, military organizations and their contractors to clean up the soil and groundwater at the MMR. And we'll hear a good bit more about that story tonight. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, Dennis's background. Uh, he's a relative rarity among practitioners of hydrology in that he actually has a degree in hydrology. He has a, a BS in hydrology from the University of New Hampshire, and he also holds a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering from MIT. Um, he's also a rarity in that he has worked for one organization for essentially all of his entire professional career, the Massachusetts Office of the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, he told me just the other day that he has the best job in the world. He does work that he finds fascinating and in just downright fun. Um, I'm sure you'll get a sense for his enthusiasm for that work as well, his, as well as his genuine insight into groundwater systems in his lecture tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dennis for our 31st Freeman Lecture. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Am I too loud? Yeah. I'm usually too loud. It's, it's, it's one of my characteristics, I'm sorry. And then I'll try not to laser you. We'll see how this works here. There we go, great. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Pete. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be introduced by Pete, one of my very close friends. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to present the Freeman Lecture this evening. And uh, it's especially a pleasure to be able to do it in front of uh, so many people here I see so many familiar faces of people who have been so important to me in my personal life, my family's here, and my professional life as well. So I'd like to thank you very much for all coming, and uh, I hope that you'll enjoy the, the lecture. The cleanup, uh, the environmental restoration programs at the Mass Military Reservation are indeed a very complicated and very expensive uh, venture. Uh, through about the end of 19, uh, through the end of about 2007, they expect to have spent about $925 million on the cleanup, and the projected additional cost uh, to the end of the cleanup is another $460 million. So we're talking about a, a $1.4 billion groundwater cleanup effort. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, project involving many, many hundreds of people, and uh, one could spend many evenings like this talking about almost every aspect of it, from public participation to the role of politicians, to the, uh, the military's perspective, to the engineers and the pipes and the plumbing. Uh, so uh, we can't do all that tonight, I assure you. So what I've chosen to do is to uh, focus on a part of the story that I'm familiar with, which I call the hydrologic story. And even here, I only can really tell you a little piece of it. So what I thought I would do, rather than going into great detail about it or uh, trying to give you a real total history, would be to just give you some sense for how our understanding of the hydrology of Western Cape Cod evolved along with the cleanup program and some of the insights that were gained uh, through this process. Uh, I'm going to use the general we in my talk because to try to give everybody credit for all the work you're going to see here would be impossible in this short time. But uh, I do want to thank all the many hundreds of people who did all the work, and I get the pleasure of being up here and giving you the presentation. I won't give you all credit individually, but please, please do know that uh, we appreciate that. I also want to point out that the cleanup program is run by the Air Force Center for Environmental Excellence, uh, the Army Environmental Center, and the Mass National Guard. And I'm, uh, I work with the USGS uh, Toxic Substances Hydrology Program. So all these programs, of course, work together to provide the funding of what you're going to see. 
So, um, and then one other thank you I want to make before I forget, because uh, I'll forget at the very end, is that uh, several people here helped me put together these slides, and I hope you'll enjoy the graphics. Some of them are actually like a time warp. We go back in time to pre-PC days, so I think you'll enjoy some of these graphics. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Tim McCobb, Luke Parsons, Don Walter, John Masterson, who helped me pull together some of these old slides and dust them off and scan them in uh, so that we could have something that was not uh, all post-PowerPoint uh, in the presentation. So. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, join me, and we're going to go back, and we're going to start off with a little bit of uh, going back in history. Uh, here's a little bit of history for you. Uh, that's me in 1975. Um, these pants were green and gray. I just can't get over it. They were, they were painful to look at in black and white, let alone in color. And uh, Jack Guswell, who some of you know, is standing just outside here. I clipped him out so I wouldn't embarrass him as well, but he was dressed equally poorly. Uh, um, so... Uh, in my outline, what I'd like to do is I'll start off with a, a description of the hydrologic setting to bring everybody up to speed. So we, those of you who haven't worked on the Cape, the three or four of you that are in the room <laughs> who haven't, uh, uh, can have a sense for the hydrologic setting. Uh, then we'll talk about the early years. Uh, I call them the years of discovery and action. Uh, then we'll uh, look a little bit at some specific processes in particular, ponds and plumes and how they interact, how we've used modeling to predict flow paths and try to figure out where sources of contamination are. And then I'll talk a little about, about a very global insight we've gotten from our work, which is what I call the recharge mosaic. And then I'll venture on very, very dangerous ground with one slide that talks about where I think this might all end up uh, in the future. And then I'll have to live with the emails that all the people sent me tomorrow saying, you're completely wrong. So we'll go from there. So first, uh, uh, a bit about the, uh, the setting. Uh, this is Cape Cod. Everybody here knows where Cape Cod is. Uh, the Massachusetts Military Reservation is located on the western part of Cape Cod here. Uh, uh, the Cape Cod is separated from the mainland by a sea level canal, so it's really an island completely surrounded by seawater. The only source of water to the Cape is the rainfall that falls directly on the land area of the Cape. Uh, the Mass Military Reservation is located, as, you, as I said, on the western part of the Cape on what's called the Sagamore Freshwater Lens. It's an island here. Uh, these are contours of the water table, uh, sort of an independent flow cell separated from the mainland by the sea level Cape Cod Canal. Uh, the Mass Military Reservation, and I'll call it the MMR from now on, uh, is a multi-use military facility actually owned by the state of Massachusetts, leased to the, Air, uh, to the Air Force, I believe, and then leased back to a variety of tenants. Um, during World War II, it was a major staging area for, uh, for uh, soldiers going to the European theater. There were over 70,000 troops on the base at some times. And during the Cold War, it was Otis Air Force Base uh, with uh, its fighters and uh, tankers that went up with the fighters. Uh, today, it's, a, again, a multi-use facility. Uh, the Mass Army National Guard runs Camp Edwards, which is an Army National Guard uh, training area. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, it's the home of Coast Guard Air Station Cape Cod, one of the largest Coast Guard facilities in the country, actually. Uh, Otis Air National Guard Base uh, has active uh, F-15 fighter wing there. And then if, uh, in the center, you see it's also home to the uh, Massachusetts National Cemetery. I don't remember the exact name, but it's a, it's a veteran's cemetery. Uh, it's very large. And then finally, I put down on the lower right the environmental programs, the Air Force Center for Environmental Excellence, or AFSI's Installation Restoration Program, the Army Environmental Center's Impact Area Groundwater Study Program, and then the Mass Guard's current activities, uh, their, the management of their current activities. So it's a multi-use, fairly complicated place. There's no base commander, which is kind of interesting. It has many commanders, and they get together and they have breakfast, and they, and they discuss how they're going to uh, run the base. When you get up in the air over the MMR, uh, this is a view looking uh, north, uh, east, roughly. Um, get up in the air uh, in a helicopter, for example. The, the first thing you can see, obviously, in here in the middle is what they call the developed part of the base. That's where the airfield is, uh, the runways, the airplanes, and so forth. And then uh, the, there's, there's another northern 14,000 acres that's used for Army training, which is to the left and out of the, out of the picture. In the distance, you see Cape Cod Bay. Uh, this is obviously the Atlantic Ocean. But the other thing you see in the photo, uh, which always strikes me when we get up in the air over, the, over any part of the Cape, are all the lakes. We tend to think of the Cape as a seashore and the ocean, but the reality is that what really strikes you when you get up in the air above it is all the freshwater lakes, huge lakes, miles across or maybe half a mile across, that dot the landscape. There's over 400 of them. And these lakes really are outcrops or windows, if you will, as we'll see a little later, uh, to this vast groundwater reservoir that underlies the Cape. So let's talk a bit about that reservoir. This is a map uh, of the, the western part of the Cape. Here's the Cape Cod Canal for reference, and Woods Hole is down over here. Uh, and this is a map uh, showing first the sufficial geology, 
Uh, the cape was, is a relatively recent deposit. It's about 15,000 years old, deposited at the end of the Pleistocene uh, by the ice sheets as they receded from uh, New England. Uh, and its major features are a couple of moraines indicating the uh, standstill position of the ice for some period of time. These are the backbones of the cape. And then these large outwash plains in lighter color that emanate out from uh, the, uh, the moraines. Within this uh, material, we receive about 45 inches of rainfall a year. That percolates down, or some part of that percolates down into the ground and recharges the aquifer, creating a water table mound within those sands and gravels, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, with a high point here just on the eastern edge of the Mass Military Reservation, which is outlined here uh, at an altitude of about 70 feet above sea level. So you have this water table mound that forms because of all the recharge, and groundwater flows laterally outward toward discharge at the coast, uh, streams, wetlands, uh, ponds, and so forth at the coast. Uh, groundwater flow rates in this aquifer are on, the, are on the order of one to two feet per day. So it's a very water-rich uh, system with uh, fairly high rates of groundwater flow. Uh, what we're going to do now is take a slice north to south through here just to get a sense for what it looks like in the vertical. Uh, this is that slice uh, through the Cape. Here's Cape Cod Bay to the north, Nantucket Sound to the south, and here's an altitude scale in feet above or below sea level. The Cape sits on uh, crystalline bedrock. It's a granite diorite. Uh, relatively impermeable relative to the sand above it. And this sand pile that was left behind by the glaciers uh, in the area of the MMR is about 300, 400 feet thick, again, resting on this crystalline bedrock. The upper part of the saturated zone is defined by the water table, which is the DAS blue line right here. So you have this lens, or a yeah, lens, I guess you could call it, of fresh water that's fed by aerial recharge from precipitation. We estimate that the area gets around 27, 26, 27 inches of recharge a year. About the other part of the precipitation is lost to evaporation and transpa transpiration. But that translates into about a million and a half gallons per square mile on an average day, every day. So it's a lot of water moving through the system, moving downward, outward, and then discharging at the coast. Now, if we're going to take a look in here, and we hire some geophysicists, um, and the geophysicists get up there and uh, try to take a look for us. Uh, what we see, obviously, through drilling, not through doing this particular activity here. Uh, this guy didn't uh, take the 40-hour OSHA course, obviously. Um, uh, what we see is that that sand and gravel aquifer is really composed of lenses and layers of sands and gravels deposited by the ice sheet. Uh, very permeable. Uh, for those of you who are hydrologists, hydraulic conductivities here are on the order of 300 feet per day. So it's a very permeable uh, material with, with high groundwater flow rates. So that's sort of a, a set the stage. Now let's go to the second part, which is this, uh, the early years, I called it. Um, really, our whole story starts here at the wastewater treatment plant uh, that served the MMR from about 1936 to 1995, December 13th, 1995, to be exact. Uh, it's a secondary wastewater treatment plant that was built uh, to serve uh, the soldiers as they came in for uh, World War II. Uh, it provided secondary treatment to the effluent uh, being produced on the base. That's pretty much domestic municipal sewage. And uh, the effluent from the treatment plant was disposed of onto these rectangular infiltration lagoons. You see one of them here being operated in 1984, where the effluent was spread onto the ground. This treated wastewater was spread onto the ground, soaked about 20 feet down to the water table, recharged the aquifer, and then became part of the groundwater system. Um, the reason why our story starts here is because, uh, really, one of the first published articles I could find on the possibility of groundwater contamination, I think somewhat uh, interestingly, was published by the Boston Society of Civil Engineers in their journal in 1970 by two gentlemen, uh, Mead and Vaccaro, uh, Woods Hole uh, scientists, who um, hypothesized that although there was sort of a notion of out of sight, out of mind, you dispose of the wastewater and the groundwater in the, uh, into the sewage beds and then it was renovated, uh, in fact, there probably was some sort of contamination that resulted from this. And they went out and attempted to find that contamination by sampling house wells downstream. They didn't have much of a budget. Some things never change, I guess. And, uh, and uh, they weren't able to find the, the plume that was arising from here, but they certainly hypothesized that it existed. So the BSCES really played a role in this uh, early on. Um, in uh, the late 70s, the Mass DEP, or actually the Mass DEQE, some of you must remember the Department of Environmental Quality Engineering, the precursor to DEP, the predecessor, uh, was concerned that a lot of towns in southeastern Massachusetts were having wastewater problems and they wanted to build wastewater treatment plants. And the, because there are very few major streams uh, uh, in the area and it's difficult to dispose of it to the ocean, there was a thought of using land disposal. So they asked the USGS, 
uh, to partner with them to look at a wastewater treatment plant somewhere in western in eastern mass and determine whether what the impact was on groundwater quality in fact my good friend jack gusway i believe was the person who wrote the proposal for this um, and um, that was my first project so uh, we went out there and uh, took a look at what the uh, impact of this disposal was on groundwater quality uh, it's it's a little hard to think back to the days in the early 70s or late 70s uh, when there weren't a lot of plume studies it wasn't sort of a common knowledge about how these things worked and uh, every study was sort of a new window on on, the, on what these plumes might look like and what the processes were uh, so here are some uh, high-level graphics uh, from uh, 19, uh, the late 70s, uh, drawn by hand with colored cellophane. Some of you probably got to do this too. Um, what we did is we went out, uh, down gradient from these infiltration beds and drilled wells or took advantage of wells that were already there. And we were able to uh, map the water table, which we saw in this case here, sloped from an uh, altitude of about 50 down to 30 feet along in this direction. Uh, inferred from that the directions of groundwater flow and then sampled the water for a variety of chemical constituents. I just happened to use specific conductance here as a general indicator. And you can see that we almost immediately, within the first few holes, were able to define uh, what we now today would just take as an obvious plume of contamination emanating from these infiltration beds. Now, what I guess puzzled Mead and Vaccaro, because they didn't have the data, was the longitudinal section down that plume. So this is what I'm going to show you here is a transverse section along a flow line running roughly in here. Uh, showing you the vertical picture. Uh, this is a uh, cross-section, north on the left, south on the right. Groundwater is flowing from left to right. Uh, this is the water table here with the dark line being land surface. Uh, here's your altitude and feet above and below sea level. And this was detergents. Um, detergents turned out to be a fantastic indicator of where the wastewater plume was because detergents were disposed of in the plant from almost its beginning. And from about the late 40s, early 50s, when detergents really first came into use, until almost uh, exactly 1964-65 when they switched from uh, non-biodegradable to biodegradable detergents, most of the detergents that went in were non-biodegradable. And so we could actually go out anywhere in this plume and take a water sample and we would get foaming on a bucket like this and we could tell where the plume was just based on this legacy or this uh, fossil plume of detergents that was moving off down gradient. Kind of neat. Um, but one of the features I wanted to point out with this was that uh, we noticed right away that the plume seemed to dive down below the water table, and it was quite narrow relative to it, right, quite thin relative to its width. Uh, this is only about uh, uh, 75, 80 feet thick relative to being miles long, and it was always overlain by some clean water. This is because the whole cape is the recharge area. Unlike a lot of parts of the country where you have the recharge area and the discharge area, the land is very, the soils are very permeable, they're all sandy, and so you get recharge everywhere over the Cape. And so these plumes, as they move away from a source, get depressed by rainfall recharge that comes in on top of them. So it's very typically of the plumes on the Cape, they have a clean zone uh, above them. So sort of by the late 70s, we knew that at least there was one plume at the MMR. And uh, this was, of course, only based on what I'd call traditional uh, wastewater contaminants, uh, things that civil engineers would, would worry about up to that point. Well, in 1983, the USGS began a program called the Toxic Substances Hydrology Program, and it was designed to look at uh, the processes that affected the fate and transport of toxic contaminants in groundwater. And they were thinking primarily things like toxic metals, uh, industrial solvents, fuels, and so forth. And one of the sites that was nominated uh, for this program to be a field site for long-term research was the wastewater plume. And there was a lot of debate within the USGS about it being sort of a waste. Why are we going to study sewage? That doesn't fall in the category of toxic waste. Uh, well, there was this gentleman here, uh, Mike Thurman, an organic geochemist with the USGS, who I would call a visionary, that kind of personality, who said, this is an Air Force base. And that may look like a wastewater plume, but I'll be willing to bet you that everything but the kitchen sink was going down the sewer. All the cleaning solvents, fuels, whatever else was being spilled on the ground. And if we go look for some of these things, things like tetrachloroethylene or PCE or trichloroethylene or TCE, they'll be out there. So we'll get out our new GC and we'll give this a try. Now, people weren't doing this on a regular basis, I don't think, at that point. Um, so sure enough, we went out in 1983. Here's Mike standing in one of the old sewage beds um, and uh, sampled the wells that we had sampled to define the wastewater plume, and we found a plume of solvents. Uh, concentrations as high as 600 micrograms per liter, 600 parts per billion combined uh, TCE and PCE. So before the military even shows up, we've got a solvent plume for them to work on. Right? And they do show up. Uh, in 1983, 84-ish or so, 
the uh, DOD began its installation restoration program, a program where they would go out, do record searches at military bases, uh, look for potential places where fuels or solvents or whatever had been disposed of to the ground, go out and drill and try to find those plumes and then determine how they would clean them up. So when the, uh, when the DOD showed up at the site, uh, environmental DOD folks anyway, showed up at the site in 1983, we said, hi, we're the USGS and here's your first plume you can work with. Uh, so uh, what we started off with, of course, is here's this plume uh, in the Ashumit Valley, we call it the wastewater plume that contains the solvents. And they did a record search and they came up with a number of locations, uh, fuel spills, landfill and so forth, that they thought might contain contamination. And they proceeded with a drilling program well, it didn't take them long to start to fill in the map. Uh, this is the map in 1991. You can see plumes begin to form here. Um, this is uh, the landfill plume over here. This is a plume out of a missile uh, site. Here's our wastewater plume, and there's a fire training area. So they begin to build these, this map of plumes. A little bit more drilling, the plumes get a little bit bigger. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a, a joke at one time that uh, we discovered a new transport mechanism. The advection dispersion equation. You had advection, you had dispersion, and you had drilling as the third, uh, as the third mechanism. And uh, there was a gentleman over here who uh, uh, still lives there, a guy by the name of George Seaver, a uh, local citizen, but also, I, I don't know if he was an MIT engineer or not, but optics engineer, but pretty sharp guy. He painted a 55-gallon drum that said, end of the plume, and it would migrate around the neighborhood every time they'd release a new map. <laughs> and sometimes it would go upstream, and sometimes it would go downstream, and it would move over, and uh, they'd track the drum as it moved around the neighborhoods. Um, but people were beginning to get a sense that this was a fairly serious problem. And uh, the state, uh, a gentleman with the state um, responsible for the groundwater quality on the western part of the Cape uh, did a little calculation. Uh, he looked at the width of these fronts of these plumes uh, here. He knew that the groundwater velocity was on the order of a foot a day or so. Uh, I don't know whether he corrected for porosity or not. But uh, he did a calculation and said 8 million gallons a day of Cape Cod's precious groundwater was being polluted by letting these plumes advance. And many of these plumes were just off the base or were still on the base. This one was an exception, of course, because we uh, had been defined earlier on. And the notion was we've got to stop this before it gets any worse. We need to contain these plumes as much as possible on the base so that then we can clean them up. So the uh, notion of uh, plume containment uh, arose at that point. Now, it's easy to have hindsight, but I think if we'd known the real history of disposal on the base, how many years things might have been going on the ground, and done some back-of-the-envelope calculations, we might have realized that many of these plumes, in fact, were bigger than appeared in this map. But that's, that's hindsight. You have to sort of put yourself back to that day. This was shocking enough all by itself. So what do you do when you have a problem like this? You get a committee together, okay? Um, how many of you lived through TQM, Total Quality Management, the rage, the management rage? Somebody had to in this room. Anyways, it was one of these management raises when the Japanese were going to take over our country because they were doing TQM. Um, th this is a uh, group that was put together. They were called the Plume Management Process Action Team. Process Action Team was, was what, part of the jargon of TQM, uh, Total Quality Management, although this drawing, which was drawn by a local citizen who would come uh, and sit in the meetings, he called it Total Quandary Management instead of Total Quality Management. Um, these were meetings that were put together to try to decide what to do about containing these plumes. Uh, this is Dan Santos, who was the uh, program manager at the time in the middle of the ring. Uh, he's being skewered by the two chief activists, self-appointed, uh, Joel Feigenbaum and James Kinney over here, uh, skewering him. Um, the guy from DEP is lending a helpful hand, but is cleverly outside the ring, just to be safe. Uh, one of our activists didn't want to quite muddy it up so badly, so she just would uh, raise her fist there. In the, in the, and there were people to record the meetings, someone to make sure that we were being polite. Um, uh, this is uh, a person from EPA, I don't think he's in the audience, uh, throwing in the towel. Uh, the guy from the county over here, and here I am, the scientist, pulling my hair out, going, what the hell is this all about? Uh, it, was, it was a bit of a muddle. Uh, but anyways, this team came up with the idea of trying to contain all the plumes at one time by building a pump and treat system to keep them in place. Well, everybody liked this idea, at least it was action. Uh, so who shows up after the committee? The politicians. Uh, the politicians show up. I think this gives you some sense for uh, people always ask me, why have they spent $1.4 billion? Well, just look at the table. Uh, John Kerry, uh, Ted Kennedy. Uh, this is Gary Studs, the, the congressman at the time uh, at the table. They all came and helped cut the ribbon for this, uh, this system and were off and running. Contractors are hired, and uh, here we go. Well, right away, things, things begin to take a turn uh, in the wrong direction. 
Uh, first of all, as they began to design these systems, they had to do what they call the data gap work. They had to go in and actually drill more holes where they would uh, do some of the, the uh, plume uh, treatment. And as they drilled holes, of course, the plumes continued to grow by, that, grow by that third transport process drilling. So right away, some of these plumes clearly had already reached the coast. A bunch of them had intersected ponds. Uh, there were new plumes showing up in the picture. So right away, this notion of containing everything before it left the base was really kind of based on a flawed idea. Um, not necessarily a bad idea to try to treat the plumes, but this notion that they hadn't left the base yet was clearly in trouble. Um, contractors were hired uh, and probably given like ridiculous time, ridiculous amount of money, uh, small amounts, and, and were, were rushed into trying to come up with a design, actually design this idea of containing the, the, the plumes. And in 1996, uh, in what is known uh, in the, uh, the annals of the MMR as the 60% design, for reasons that I'm not even sure why it's called that, um, the, uh, a proposed treatment system was rolled out to the public and the regulators. What they proposed to do was to go to the toes of all these plumes and put in extraction wells, 128 of them in total, and pump the water out, put it through activated carbon to remove the solvents, and then re-inject the water back in the aquifer to maintain the hydraulic balance. Because I think early on people realized a citizen who has a one in a million chance of getting cancer from one of these plumes is an angry citizen. But a citizen whose pond level has dropped two feet is a really angry citizen. And so the, real, the recognition was that you couldn't just take this water out and then put it back willy-nilly. You had to maintain a hydraulic balance so that uh, the lake levels and pond levels wouldn't change. So they came up with a system to pump uh, out of these 128 wells, and they were going to pump 27 million gallons a day. This is twice as much water as, as was being pumped for public water supply for the whole Cape. So people were just astonished. They predicted some fairly significant drawdowns, but fortunately not in areas that were environmentally critical. But we'll get back to that in a second. Um, Tom Camberary, the Barnstable County hydrologist, uh, one of the people who was astonished by this, said, the National Guard Bureau proposes to replace the natural groundwater flow system with an artificially controlled one that is powered by pumps and electricity. People were just uh, astonished. They didn't quite know what to do with this. Um, so um, there was quite a bit of a hue and cry. My colleagues and I, uh, some folks from the Air Force uh, and uh, uh, some of the regulators, I think Dick Willie was involved in this as well from EPA, sat down and looked at this proposed system and something struck us as we're looking at it. Something was, something was wrong. They're going to pump out 27 million gallons a day and you'll notice that these are drawdown contours, two, four, six, eight feet of drawdown, meaning the water table would be lowered. You'll notice that there's no drawdown at any of the lakes, including that little guy right there. It seemed like something was wrong with the analysis, because one would expect if you're going to move this much water around, and these lakes are really just, as I said before, outcrops of the water table, you'd see some drawdown at the lakes. So I asked my colleagues at the USGS, because we had done a regional model, not as detailed as the one that had been used here, but sufficient, to put the same system into our regional model where the lake levels could go up and down with the water table. And this was the drawdown map that we came up with for the same exact system. Huge drawdown cones, because these lakes were no longer fixed, Drawdown at a Schumann pond, for example, was over eight feet. So not only was this a huge amount of water proposed to be pumped, but in fact, the design had a flaw in it in the sense that the lake levels wouldn't be allowed to change. And in fact, they would, of course, and there'd be way too much drawdown. So, so in a sense, it was back to the drawing board. If you read the wonderful book by Seth Rolbein, uh, he wrote two books about the cleanup. Uh, one is called uh, The Enemy Within, and then the other, next one's called About Face, and the two books are separated by this moment in time. Uh, what happens, he says, and very clearly in his book, is that a white knight was brought in. The white knight, the Air Force Center for Environmental Excellence, there's a bunch of those guys out here, uh, basically a part of the military that was a big engineering group with lots of contracting capability was brought in to try to, to rectify the situation. Uh, I'm not going to go into what happened in detail from there, just to give you a sense for it, though, uh, because we could then go plume by plume. But clearly the 60% design uh, had, had uh, not been accepted. What happened uh, over the next... 10, 15 years, uh, is that these various plans from the 1996 era with these lines of extraction wells and injection wells were ultimately replaced through a very, very uh, involved program of involving the citizens, involving the regulators, lots of give and take. Uh, they had charts that looked like the consumer reports with the little dots that were half full and half empty saying good, bad. People got to vote on the, it's amazing to have citizens vote on treatment systems, but they did. Um, they came up with modifications to these uh, 1996 plans uh, that would still achieve the goal of cleaning up the plumes but be more environmentally benign. And ultimately, 
This particular plume here, the Ashumit Valley plume, uh, evolved from this in 96 to that first try with the new AFSI group in 1998 to ultimately what they put in in 1999, which turned out to be just three extraction wells a central treatment building, which you see down in the lower right, and then infiltration galleries to put the water back in. Basically pumping out the cores of the plumes, treating the water, and then using the water as recharge hydraulically to help contain the plumes and move them towards the treatment systems. And this was done uh, for all the plumes individually. Now about this time, people ask me, why pump and treat? Uh, you oftentimes hear that pump and treat doesn't work in groundwater remediation. But here at the Cape, for the MMR situation, it really is actually pretty effective, and that was, has been uh, looked at by a variety of uh, uh, expert panels that have been brought in to answer that question. And I just want to mention that briefly. This is pretty typical in cartoon sense that you have an extraction well down in the plume for the pump. You pump the water up out of the plume, up into a treatment building uh, where you have granular activated carbon to strip out the solvents, and then you put the clean water back down in the aquifer, either through an injection well or through an infiltration gallery. Uh, pump and treat works at the MMR because, for one thing, the military almost immediately had an aggressive program to remove most of the sources. They dug up the contaminated soil tens of thousands of cubic meters and treated it so you no longer had sources going in. They capped the landfill. They took the wastewater treatment plant. They built a brand-new state-of-the-art plant, and they piped the effluent uh, nine miles away toward the Cape Cod Canal. So they removed the sources. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is, even though it's an Air Force base, and we know that they use solvents, D-napples, which are dense, non-aqueous phase liquids, meaning to say the TCE or the PCE, these solvents in their pure form, which are denser than water. Uh, there's really no known D-napples, or at least none that have been identified below the water table. There's no pools of solvent down there creating plumes that will be there for generations. Uh, it appears that most of the D-napples were in small quantities and just uh, uh, have, have dispersed. Uh, the permeable aquifer is it's, it's a really permeable aquifer. It has very few fine zones, so groundwater flushes through it pretty quickly. Uh, the quartz sands have very little sorptive capacity. Uh, these solvents move almost as conservative tracers. Very high recharge rates and groundwater flow rates, so things get flushed through pretty quickly. And you end up with basically large dilute trace level organic plumes, meaning to say that the majority of these plumes are, are amazingly good quality water with a trace level of organic, a few parts per billion organics in them. Uh, maybe up to 1,000 ppb of, say, the TCE or PCE. But generally, they move with the flowing groundwater. So it's possible to put in these treatment wells, pump it out, and then treat it and put it back in. Uh, you don't end up with this uh, rinsing the sponge problem as much as you do in some other places. So that's sort of the early years. The early years, uh, we, need, we demand action. Uh, what are some of the things we learned hydraulically along the way? Well, here's the map in 1997. Uh, we've gone another year now in time. Uh, these plumes have grown, and there's some plumes that have shown up in here. Um, one thing we noticed is that these plumes, many of these plumes are intersecting either streams, which are groundwater drains, or they intersected ponds. And the question was, what happens to them when they intersect these surface water bodies? Do they discharge into the surface water body, and then the volatiles evaporate out of them, and they're essentially being treated, or do they pass beneath the ponds? You know, what happens at these ponds? Um, this is an aerial view of a Schumann pond, which is this pond right here. Typical glacial kettle pond on Cape Cod. No surface inflow, no surface outflow. Strictly a kettle pond with only groundwater inflow and groundwater outflow. Um, groundwater comes in on the up gradient side of the ponds, flows in, discharges along the beach, and then ground, pond water leaves the pond and discharges out the other side. We call them groundwater flow-through ponds. They're really part of the groundwater system with the aquifer missing, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and the question was, of course, if one of these plumes is arriving at one of these ponds, does it go into the pond or does it pass beneath the pond? The common wisdom was that these ponds, which are oftentimes, in this case of a Schumann pond, 3,000 feet across, 10 times wider than the thickness of the aquifer, there was no way that these plumes would get by these ponds. They would discharge into the lakes. Uh, uh, just seemed to be the logical thing based on uh, uh, conceptual models. So let me show you one example of how we looked at that situation. Uh, at the storm drain five plume, which is this little tiny plume here that comes down off the base and intersects John's Pond right here. Uh, here's the SD5 plume in a, in a blown up view. Uh, the water table contours are here in feet above sea level. Here's a Schumann Pond and John's Pond. It's kind of interesting that a Schumann Pond and John's Pond, both of which are glacial kettles, differ in altitude by about six feet. A Schumann Pond being about six feet higher than John's Pond. So this little plume which originates at a, on the flight line on the base, contains about 50 parts per billion TCE, 
so it's a pretty low level uh, contamination, comes down very narrow, doesn't quite discharge into a Schumann pond, gets caught up in the flow, and then intersects the shore of John's Pond. And it seemed to be a no-brainer that it's going into the lake. This is a cross-section along that um, plume. Here's your altitude in feet. Um, I guess I see no lateral distance scale. I must have cropped it off. I'm sorry. Uh, here's the water table. Here's that plume diving below the water table, as they typically do. And, of course, they didn't drill in the lake, so the question was, what happens to it when it gets down here? Does it rise up and discharge into the lake, or doesn't it? So that's the question at hand. Uh, the technique that uh, was used for this uh, is called diffusion sampling. It's kind of clever. Um, what you do is you take a 40 mil um, milliliter glass vial, just take the cover off so it's an open vial, and you wrap it in a couple of plastic bags. You can literally see the Ziploc bags in here. So it's just basically a pocket of air contained in a plastic bag. And the vial is there just for rigidity. And you take these little vials wrapped in the plastic bags and you bury them out in the pond bottom where you expect the plume to discharge. So they're buried in the aquifer sediments where the groundwater that would be containing the plume would come up by them. And then because of uh, the equilibrium that develops between the concentrations in the air and the concentrations in the water, the VOCs can pass through the polyethylene membrane, 4 mil polyethylene, and you develop, uh, through Henry's law, an a, um, equilibrium between concentrations in the water and concentrations in the air. So you leave them in there long enough and you basically get the, the VOCs inside the air in the vial. The divers go and pluck them all out. You run them up to your field lab. The guy sticks the needle in for the gas chromatograph, sucks it out, and does an analysis real time. So you can find your plume pretty quickly. Um, so we did that at this location. Um, this is a very large blown up view of the storm drain five plume intersecting the shore of John's Pond along about a thousand feet of shoreline. At every one of these dots we buried one of those little diffusion samplers. So there were several hundred of them. And we uh, let them in, sit there for a couple of weeks, pulled them out, ran them up to uh, Scott Clifford who runs the uh, EPA Region 1 mobile lab and he analyzed them real time and we literally plotted this map on the side of the truck as we collected the samples, which is kind of neat when you get to do that. Instead of sending it off to the lab with all your chains of custodies and you wait for weeks. And, you know, here we actually had the data before we left, which was pretty neat. Um, and uh, the other thing I want to point out is that because of this equilibrium between air concentrations and water concentrations, there's a magnification in the numbers. So a TCE concentration of 50 micrograms per liter in the water, which is what we expected in the plume, would give us about 1,000 ppb by volume in the air. So that's why these numbers are so large over here. Uh, what we saw was what we expected. Here's the storm drain five plume, and here's its footprint discharging into the bottom of the lake. And in map view, that gives you an idea of the scale. So it was really, really pretty cool. I think we were pretty excited by this. We all ran around and said, yes, it worked, yes, it worked, um, because we weren't sure it would work. Except for one problem. Um, many of you have probably heard Isaac Asimov's quote, famous quote, and I'll paraphrase it because I won't memorize, memorize it. It's something like, all scientific discoveries of importance are not heralded by Eureka, but by, that's funny, you know. Well, that's what happened over here. We had three vials right near the shore. You could literally walk out to this spot and look at them, where the concentrations were, it turned out to be close to 20 times higher than the concentrations that we expected in the footprint in these three little vials. Well, the analysts came bounding out of the truck saying, you told me I'd only get 1,000 and you've wrecked my GC. Da, 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 da. And they said, well, we're really sorry. And we couldn't imagine what we'd done. So we went back out and because we could actually walk out there, we thought we'd just stick a little uh, well point in, pull water out. And sure enough, the water at that location, the groundwater coming in the lake, had a concentration of TCE of 1,200 micrograms per liter. They'd never seen more than 50 over here. So we were really puzzled by this. So we immediately suspected that something was going on right here near shore at Mr. Smith's house. Now I thought that Mr. Smith was a code word for years until I met Mr. Smith and that's what his name was, the poor guy. He was actually Mr. Smith and um, we, we thought maybe Mr. Smith had run, was running a little machine shop in his basement or something and was dumping solvents down after he cleaned his parts. Uh, we never dreamed that it could be coming from that far away because the nearest plumes on the MMR that had concentrations up that high were several miles away on the wrong side of a couple of lakes. So it really didn't seem to make any, any sense. So uh, doing what all good scientists do is we went out and did more sampling. Um, we went out and over that little spot where we had found those three vials, uh, we went out and did another round of sampling. Now look at the scale over here. This is only 50 feet. Okay, so we laid out an intense, uh, very, very dense grid of samplers right on the beach. Some of these were only a few feet offshore and actually found that this indeed was a little footprint of some sort of a plume originating from on land. Uh, with very high concentrations, much higher than what we were seeing in the main footprint. 
brought out, brought out a little uh, all-terrain vehicle mounted drill rig, which could get right along the shore and drill the hole right there. This is the Air Force did this, to see if we could look at what is the plume that's creating this. Now, we envisioned that this plume would be just below the water table, just below the beach, because you could walk from here to the chairs, and you could be standing on its outflow. And what we got was, again, one of those, that's funny kind of results. Um, this is a, a vertical profile from that hole. This is zero, which is really the beach level or the pond level, feet in depth. Here's concentrations of TCE in micrograms per liter in the water. Here's our TCE plume. Yes, indeed, there was a plume down there with concentrations up over 1,000, but it was overlain by close to 30, 40 feet of clean water. This didn't seem to be possible. We were rather puzzled by this. We looked at the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes of that water, and what we discovered was, in fact, that the water above the plume was isotopically heavier than the water in the plume. And for those of you who are into stable isotope analysis, this was indicative of the fact that the water over the plume had probably been subjected to evaporation of some sort and had been made isotopically heavier than the water in the plume. So it appeared that the water over the plume may have come out of a lake somewhere where it was subject to evaporation for a period of time overlying this TCE plume. So our whole notion of these plumes not passing beneath these lakes seemed to be starting to fall apart. And sure enough, when we looked at the map, here's our storm drain 5 plume, here's our little footprint and our little mini footprint, and here's that little TCE plume. What the base did is they drilled all the way across the isthmus and found a little tiny plume, I'd say it's 50, 100 feet wide, I'm not, not incorrect, uh, that shoots across this little isthmus and then disappears beneath a Schumann pond. And upstream, lurking upstream, was the chemical spill 10 plume, the only plume in the base with concentrations anywhere near this. So it appeared that this huge plume focused itself down to this little tiny plumelet, discovered by what I like to call the $6 million vials. <laughs> the base embarked on a, a huge drilling program on a Schumann pond. They were out there for many months with a barge, with a little drill rig, drilling down below the bottom of the pond, down into the aquifer materials below the bottom of the pond, trying to tr connect this large plume here with the little plume over here. The question being, are they somehow connected as it comes across and discharges into that little spot, uh, drilling many, many holes? And sure enough, it turned out that it was not just the little plume, but many plumes. This is a map view. 2005 of this chemical spill 10 plume and it actually had a whole series of fingers that come across underneath uh, a Schumann pond and in fact in this blow up view for a period of time there was even detections on the other side of John's pond too. So this really sort of shook up our ideas about how these ponds and these plumes interacted. Yes many plumes discharge into the lakes but a lot of them could pass in fact beneath them. They weren't a barrier uh, to transport. So does this have any importance? Well, one of the things it did is it made us realize that when you looked at these plumes that move off down gradient, and you go to a, a map like this one here, and the modelers say to you, well, that's fine that your data say the plume's there, but they can't be there because the water would be way too old. And, you know, a colleague of mine once said, I'm sorry the data are inconvenient for you. Uh, but what it basically told us was that there had to be a lot more flow and a lot more rapid flow in the aquifer at depth than we'd anticipated. And not only that is, as they began to drill more and more deep borings into the aquifer, this is a cross-section of the aquifer from north to south. Um, here's the moraine over here, and here are the outwash. The original model was that the outwash was much finer at depth than it was in the shallow materials. This brown material was much coarser than the finer materials, and that the aquifer fined or became less permeable with depth. But with plumes moving down at great distances down in this material, and more and more boreholes showing coarse sands and gravels. Our whole conceptual model of the geology, the hydrogeology of the Cape had to change. We had to make this whole sand pile more permeable to let these plumes get far enough in our models to, to, uh, to do this kind of analysis. How that water level would drop and the only way to keep it up is to add more water as rain, more recharge. And so over the years, our recharge number that we use in our groundwater flow models has increased from 22 inches a year to 26 inches a year. And some models now are even using 32 inches a year of recharge out of a total precip of only 45 inches. I like to say that probably the number one thing that the whole cleanup program has done for the, for the people of Cape Cod is they've increased the water supply 50% just by model calibration. <laughs> I think you can't, get, you can't get more out of groundwater modeling than that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, 
But it, it sort of forces us to, to, to revisit our entire um, uh, way of thinking. Now, this was all about water supply, obviously. So let's go to the next part of the talk. Um, as they began to map these plumes, here's our plume map in 1997, um, more and more public supply wells that served the people of Cape Cod and the people on the base, these red dots, were becoming potentially impacted by these solvent plumes, in particular the solvents, from the southern part of the base. There were many other water supply wells, these yellow dots, uh, that were not thought to be at risk, they were not contaminated, but there was a real concern that there was a stress on the water supply and that in the long run there wouldn't be enough water available of good quality. And people began to look at this northern 14,000 acres here, which is the Camp Edwards Army Training Center, uh, Guard uh, area. When you get up and look at this area, it's a wildlife preserve, except for an occasional bomb that's thrown out there. Um, they actually have deer herds that they have to hunt. There are turkeys. It, it's really uh, one of the largest undeveloped natural areas uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, and so, as Ted Kennedy says, we have our, and this is a, this is a quote, our underground Chernobyl over here uh, could be saved by our underground Cape Cod Squabin up here. Um, unfortunately, out there in that area used for training, this area here, in particular this yellow area called the impact area, there are things like carcasses of army tanks that are used for uh, target practice, and they've been used that way since the early 1900s. So there was a concern, is this really pristine up there? The EPA, and I don't know if they ordered them or what the exact words are to use, but anyways, it was suggested to the military, I guess, that they go out and look at the water quality in this northern 14,000 acres to see if there was any contamination. The military, I believe, truly thought that these explosions, these shells that would go out there and be fired, completely consumed things in the shells, things like RDX and HMX, which are these high-energy explosives, and that they wouldn't have contamination. In fact, that's how the groundwater modelers got involved. Uh, to show that the flow paths on which sampling was being done were the correct ones, that there would be contamination there, but there just wasn't. Well, as they began to sample, they began to get detections, you see here in orange and green, of a variety of new chemicals at the MMR, or newly discovered chemicals, things like RDX, HMX, which are uh, explosives compounds, uh, in groundwater, in and around the impact area. In fact, there was an article that came out in Outside magazine in August 1997 that said, are you sure the Kennedys live around here? And they had this photo on the cover, and then it said, after 62 years of shelling on New England's summer playground, the EPA orders the military to hold its fire. So actually, the military was uh, ordered to stop its artillery practice until they could resolve what the range of uh, contamination was here. Now, I, I get a chuckle as I was looking at this. One of my colleagues as an editor pointed out it's grammatically incorrect. And this says that the EPA did the shelling for 62 years. Uh, but uh, we'll let that one slide. I'm sure they'd like to hear that news. Um, so, so one of the ways that the, we got involved was to try to look at, and when they got these detections in the groundwater, as you see here by these uh, double circles up here in, uh, I guess it's red, uh, where might those have originated? Because they really didn't know what the sources would look like up in the area where all the target practice. Were they looking for shells? Were they looking for dispersed little hunks of, of the explosives? They didn't know. So uh, my colleagues uh, and uh, with the USGS and with the military began to do, use groundwater flow models to reverse particle track. In other words, they would put into their models the locations in their groundwater model. This is a cross-section of a groundwater model with altitude here, uh, distance along the side. These are the model cells. And they would mathematically backtrack in their models to the point at land surface where the particle should have originated. And then they would go out and look and see if they could find sources at those locations. So that was one of the ways that groundwater modeling was used early on, when they didn't have nicely defined plumes and nicely defined sources to work off of. Um, now, as uh, uh, these modelers would probably uh, uh, testify, and I, th I know there's several of them in here, it was rather dis dis disconcerting to go to the meetings and watch people argue about these mathematically precise lines and the fact that you had to drill right on that line and not 50 feet over to one side or the other because you'd miss the plume. Uh, there was a little bit of a, a real lack of reality there, but uh, in any case, these proved to be very useful in trying to figure out uh, sources of contamination. And in fact, with time, this is kind of a neat view, uh, this is a, 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 a view out of uh, Google Maps, or Google Earth, I guess. Uh, this shows the outline of the impact area. There's a fence all the way around it. Uh, the top of the groundwater mound is actually over here somewhere. This is where all the artillery practice uh, took place. And all these little spots you see here, which we're sure the Russians are up there looking at, thinking missile silos or something else, what they are are drilling pads for the groundwater uh, rig that went off and would dutifully move over and cut trees down to make sure they hit that mathematical particle in those simulations. Uh, fortunately, I think we're beyond that, but in the early days, uh, that was actually going on.
So with time, what we see is the plumes begin to fill in, particularly up here in the impact area. You see the plumes gradually filling in, plumes of RDX, HMX, and a new contaminant that arose recently, perchlorate. Uh, perchlorate, I like to think of as the contaminant du jour. Um, and uh, it's uh, associated with things like flares, uh, propellants in um, uh, various kinds of munitions, uh, and so forth. Um, and so uh, some of these plumes actually are perchlorate. I'd like to just talk a little bit about this one up in here. This is called the Northwest Connor. You notice how it doesn't originate way up at the top here, but it originates right at the edge of the MMR. Uh, this is that perchlorate plume as it was mapped in December 2003. Uh, it originates just on the MMR, right in here, intersects the Cape Cod Canal with perchlorate concentrations up around uh, 18 micrograms per liter. This plume was kind of an, a puzzle because uh, there was no real known source of perchlorate up in here that the military could associate with any kind of training records or disposal records. It seemed to sort of appear here somewhat magically at fairly high concentrations and then move off uh, toward the Cape Cod Canal. So again, this is where the, the modelers came into play went to all the locations where there had been detections of perchlorate, did that backtracking of those particles I mentioned before, and came up with a possible source area for this plume, which is indeed right at the base boundary and very close to this plume, not way up on the reservation miles away. And that's when someone realized, perhaps a resident of the town who was on one of the citizens' committees, hey, that's where we shoot off our fireworks every 4th of July for the town of Bourne. The people sit over here in the athletic field, the fireworks are shot off over here, and they go off in this direction here. I wonder if it's associated with that at all. Right? So to try that out, they went out on July 5th, 2003, actually before that, and they looked at the prevailing winds that day, which were in this direction here, sat out there along this power line right away, and just watched the pieces of fireworks rain down on them as they sat there uh, watching the fireworks. Clearly, the fireworks debris from this area fell in that area that had been defined by this, this model particle tracking. And in fact, when the base went out uh, along with DEP and took soil samples, they looked at soil samples in July 2nd before the fireworks took place, non-detects, huge concentrations in the soils. You see these numbers here, 7,000 micrograms per kilogram right after the fireworks. And then as rainfall gradually leached that out, the concentrations dropped uh, through September. So, and then the fireworks uh, were shown to have the, the uh, perchlorate as well. The point of all this is that by understanding how the groundwater moves using these groundwater flow models and doing things like particle tracking, you can begin to understand uh, where the water's going and how the sources and the detections are related. So one last topic. We talked a little bit about particle tracking. Again, it all comes back to water supply. And one of the questions was, where does all this water go? We have these various sources. It's unlikely we know where all the sources are yet. We don't know where all the plumes are yet. Where does all the water go? Uh, where does this recharge go when it falls at land surface, percolates down to the water table, and then becomes part of the groundwater system? And this is where the models are beginning to be used to look at the areas contributing water to wells, what we call the contributing area to wells, sort of the wells watershed, if you will. This is just a cartoon showing a pumping well here with a screen set some distance below the water table, drawing water in. And if you track that water back up to where it came in at the water table, that's the area contributing recharge. And if you plot it up in map view, you end up with a contributing area or a, a recharge area, if you will, toward the pumping well. Well, that concept was applied to various proposals for water supply on the Cape. Uh, these are various uh, pumping wells that were proposed uh, along the edges of the MMR, looking at where these contributing areas would be. The green area, for example, is the area where rainfall falling here ultimately recharges this well, the brown recharges this well, at least in a steady state average sense. And we were able to look at where water supplies might be able to be developed and how they might relate to potential sources of contamination. Now, my colleagues at the USGS began to think, well, we can do this not just for wells, but we can even look at the contributing areas to things like the harbors, rivers, the ponds. For example, this tan area here is supplies the water to Squatigue Harbor. This is its watershed, if you will, its groundwater watershed. This orange area is the contributing area to Kunameset River, right in here. Uh, these two purple areas contribute water to Ashumet and John's Pond. So you can begin to start to think that this water goes everywhere. All the recharge that falls on this part of the Cape whether it intercepts sources from the MMR or not, has a receiver, a receptor, where that water goes. It's the supplier of water to that area. And this brought to the fore this whole notion of what I call the recharge mosaic. Uh, 
that when you begin to look at all the recharge that falls on the western part of the Cape, and I mentioned early on that the whole Cape land area is the recharge area because the soils are so sandy, we can, be look, we can begin to look at the sources of water to wells, which are these purple areas, the sources of water to ponds, which are these light green areas, sources of water to rivers, which are these dark green areas, water that goes directly to the coastal water bodies are these various shades of orange. And when you put it all together, all the water goes somewhere. Now, to those of us who are in engineering and know things like mass balance and so forth, this is a fairly obvious concept, but it actually really did change, based on the work that was done at the MMR, the whole understanding that the people of Cape Cod have about their aquifer. It's not just where the military's plumes go, but it's where does my water go. When I flush my toilet and it goes into my septic system, I'm contributing water to one of these recharge areas, and where does that water go? So this has really changed sort of the whole view of the citizenry and the regulators. To give you some idea, the water balance in this part of the aquifer is shown here on the left. The natural recharge coming in, uh, this was a, with a recharge rate of about 25 inches a year in this model, is about 100 million, 180 million gallons a day on this area, huge quantity of water. Uh, an additional 7 million gallons a day comes through on-site wastewater disposal. So not a very large percentage, but of course an important percentage. How much is being taken out for water supply? Only 10 million gallons a day. The amount of water that the people on the Cape pump for water supply is actually relatively small compared to the total amount of recharge coming in. Not that they could pump all that because they would have saltwater intrusion and many other problems. Most of the water leaves by flowing out the streams or discharging directly to the coast, which is the streams are kind of a surprise because when you see them, they're little piddly things and don't really look like rivers, but, uh, but they're actually very important drains to the system. So where does things stand today? My last couple of slides. Uh, this is the, the maps of the plumes and treatment systems on the MMR as of April 4th, 2007. You can't get more current than that. Uh, thank my colleagues with the, uh, uh, the various programs that uh, supplied us with these data to bring into GIS. Uh, the greens are the, primarily the solvents and fuels plumes being uh, dealt with by the Air Force Installation Restoration Program. The purples are largely being dealt with by the Army's uh, Impact Area Groundwater Study Program, and they're largely the explosives and the perchlorates. And you'll also notice that the colors are changing from a, a harsh red to a pleasing green as we, as we, as we, uh, we treat the plumes. Um, the, um, the extraction wells are shown, or the pumping wells are shown in yellow. Uh, this is where they pump the water out. The water is put back in in injection wells or infiltration galleries uh, shown in red uh, at these locations here. So most of the treatment is going on in the southern part of the base over here in these plumes. And the Army has just begun to implement some treatment up here in the plumes in the northern uh, part of the reservation. And to summarize that in a table, uh, just to give you an idea, here are the two major programs that uh, deal with the cleanup, the Army, and the, uh, uh, the Army on the right and the Air Force on the left, solvents and fuels versus perchlorate and explosives. 11 plumes are being treated by the installation restoration program, 53 extraction wells, pumping a total of 17 and a half million gallons a day, pumping that water out, running it through carbon, and putting it back in the aquifer. Uh, the impact area groundwater study program has just begun their work. They're now treating three plumes with nine wells, pumping 1.2 million gallons a day. So they're pumping a total for uh, treatment of 18.7. This is the amount of water being pumped for all the towns between the Cape Cod Canal and the Bass River. So that includes Hyannis, Yarmouth, so forth. They're pumping less than that for water supply on an average day. Right? So this is a, a massive uh, and very significant uh, effort. Uh, I asked uh, the folks at the IRP how much they think they've pumped out of the ground so far. Uh, and uh, the estimate uh, is about 550 gallons of solvents, roughly, or about uh, 1055 gallon drums is what they've got out of the ground uh, that they've been pumping. And I don't know the total amount of water they've pumped, but uh, it's, it's significant. I don't have that number off the top of my head. So, what have we learned here? There still are some hydro head scratchers here. Um, uh, first of all, uh, somewhat remarkably, the major source of water to the Cape, in fact, the only source of water to the Cape is recharge, and we still back it out by model calibration. Uh, we really don't know exactly what the number is, and we certainly don't know how it varies in space. We have an estimate of how it varies in time. Uh, there's some concern that there are subtle geologic structures, uh, whether they be fine-grained deposits, uh, that are dispersed through the aquifer or large structures of fines versus courses that do control uh, the path and the fate of some of the plumes. Uh, the geologists uh, have incredible cat fights over this kind of thing. It's really quite a thing to see. Uh, but um, uh, there's a possibility that that's fairly important. Um, there are questions that are arising about how fast contaminants are transported in the unsaturated zone uh, because of the uh, activities in the northern part of the base, the 14,000 acres where there's lead and perchlorate 
Uh, but the unsaturated zone is very thick. Uh, they fire lead bullets. There's a question as to what the transport mechanisms are in attenuation. And, and really, we've sort of black boxed that to this point. Uh, you know, you have your land surface, and then you black box it, and it shows up at the water table, and your models magically through some process. Uh, so there's work going on right now to try to understand the unsaturated zone better. And then I'd end up with this one here, which is, how can future plume cleanup decisions better incorporate water supply planning? And I'll get to that. In other words, are there tools that can be used to link the plume cleanup at this stage with the ultimate goal, which is a water supply? So my last slide, what's the future? Uh, one can imagine that the influent, the water coming into these treatment systems, will gradually get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner as you are, have a less and less efficiency in pulling in plumes, and the concentrations will drop lower and lower to the point where you get non-detect coming in and non-detect going out. Um, so the plumes will still be there, though. There'll still be water uh, observation wells out in the plumes where you get detections of solvents. So you'll know the plumes are there, but your treatment systems aren't, you can't tell if they're doing very much anymore. Okay? So I think at that point, the focus is gradually going to change, or probably abruptly going to change, from what I'd call plume cleanup and containment to plume management. Remember we started with the plume management process action team? And then it went to, I didn't mention this, but it went to the plume containment team. Then it went to the plume cleanup team, which is the one that rings true today. I think we're going to go back to the plume management team. When there's a recognition that these plumes are there, we've done the best we can to remove most of the mass, to knock them down so they don't uh, put anyone at risk. And then ultimately, the new activists are not going to be the people who are worried about cancer and public health and uh, uh, the environment uh, in terms of environmental damage. It's going to be the water supply managers at the local and state level that are going to say, we need to evaluate what we do in these plumes from now on in the context of what it does for our water supply. And that will be the driver. So that concludes my presentation. If you want any more uh, information, you can go to our website. I have links to all the various DOD programs. And there are fact, there's a single page fact sheet at the back of the room that has uh, this link as well for you so you don't have to write it down. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Do we have time for questions? Uh, I've, I've been told that we have time for questions. So does anyone have any questions? I know this group, so it's... <laughs> okay, I've got to fix someone I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. somewhere where you have, uh, you have horizontal extraction wells. The reason I bring that up is because you showed a slide where the plume was relatively you know, uh, narrow right. and long. Wouldn't that be more susceptible to like, a horizontal extraction process as opposed to these vertical interception wells? Um, I don't know if that's ever been considered at, at the MMR, uh, except in local areas where you had a, a fairly concentrated source. Many of these plumes are more than a mile wide. And so it would be, it would be fairly, uh, you know, you can imagine the difficulty of doing that any great distance. What they, what they generally do is engineer the, the, the screened intervals of the wells to just capture the, the, the zone of contamination. And they put several in a line to essentially have the same effect you're talking about. But they only screen only part of the full thickness of the aquifer. In fact, as part of their, what they call their optimization, they'll go in and look at where the contaminants are actually coming in over time and actually pack off different parts to really focus the flow into those areas. But I don't think there's really been talk of actually drilling horizontal wells, uh, except that at certain small areas where there's a lot of contamination locally where that might be effective. But I still don't think they've actually ever done it. I don't believe they've ever done it. Any other questions at all? Yes, Mike. That picture on the lower right-hand side. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I, I didn't mention that. Um, uh, uh, Pete, uh, in, in the introduction, mentioned the USGS research site where a lot of uh, groundwater research has been done. And uh, we have a, a, a research well field that's actually over that wastewater plume where we've uh, installed about 1,500 uh, multi-port wells to run our tracer experiments. And that's what, the, that's what uh, that, that photo is. Um, I was going to joke that this is the future of the MMR once you finally figure out what everything is, but uh, 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 that's obviously an experimental array where we're trying to really understand things in, in great detail. Any other questions? Yes? So are you saying with the, um, the discovery of the fireworks that went off that every place that does fireworks is really uh, adding contaminants to, to our land and water systems? So the question is, is are fireworks a, a, 
a, a pretty generic source of perchlorate wherever they're shot off. Um, my understanding is that there's perchlorate in fireworks, and so I guess the short answer to your question is yes, they, they add perchlorate to the environment. I think it, a lot depends on where you do it. If you do it over the ocean, it probably is insignificant. Um, but there have actually been some other sites where they've determined that there's perchlorate in groundwater because of, of fireworks. There's a wonderful state uh, website on the Mass DEP um, website where they summarize all the sources of perchlorate in the state of Massachusetts, and they do talk about fireworks at a couple of locations as having been identified as, as a possible source uh, for fireworks. We, uh, we actually had the opportunity to, uh, for some folks in the DOD, brief someone at DEP about this when it was first discovered. And um, I'll never forget the gentleman saying to us, and so you're going to tell me to tell the governor that we can no longer shoot off fireworks on the 4th of July. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody else? No? Feel free. Okay, great. Thank you.